Hello and welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. My name is Mike Corrado and I am with Nikon. I have been for over 35 years and I've been taking pictures for over 40 years and we want to bring you some amazing conversations with very interesting photographers. And with us today we have Mike Mezuel II. He is a landscape photographer and he chases storms and severe weather photography. Mike, welcome to the Creators Hour. How are you? Hey, thanks brother man. Doing well, a little tired, but doing awesome man. Yeah, where are you right now? So I'm back home in Allen, uh, Texas, and uh, just got off the road four o'clock this morning, got a little bit of rest, and now here uh, nerding out with you guys. So I, I, of course, I'm going to know the answer to this, but what were you doing on the road? Oh, man, we uh, just got back from doing 8,000 miles uh, through Tornado Alley the past two weeks. So chasing some of the uh, beautiful, scary storms that are out there in the plains this time of year. Mm -hmm. We're going to have some great, great conversations about that. And we thank you for putting together a collection of, of some of the work you've been doing. This has been the challenge to ask uh, very talented photographers to call down their work. But I've seen the pictures and one of them is actually hanging up in my apartment. And I'm glad that it's in this select group. Uh, and we'll talk about them and get into the backstories. But before we get there, I always love uh, to ask photographers because I'm so interested in knowing when was the first time you picked up a camera? When did the passion start to flow in photography and when did you realize that you were going to dig in and make a career out of this? Yeah, you know, it all started actually when I was 15 um, and it was actually kind of an accident. My parents at that time forgot my birthday. So they came out with a camera that my dad had in the Air Force as my gift, kind of a last minute gift. And I had no interest in photography whatsoever. So they came out, you know, you're 15 years old, you're expecting, like, all right, maybe I'll start driving, I'll get a busted up car to practice on. And uh, they came out with this old uh, Yashica MG7 camera, and uh, or MG1 camera, sorry. And uh, they're like, hey, here you go. And, you know, you open up the, the camera bag, and you're like, wait a second, this isn't, you know, car keys or something cool, this is a camera. And obviously it's film, so uh, it's a while ago. And... Uh, my dad was like, yeah, this is the camera I had while I was in the Air Force. I have no idea how to use it. And that was, that was the key moment right there. He said, I have no idea how to use it. So with us being very competitive, I was like, I'm going to learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. And I went and I shot as much as I could. And I didn't have a car. So I literally shot like, you know, very uh, interesting subjects like dead ladybugs and flowers in my parents' garden and stuff like that. And I uh, took notes down on a yellow pad and then I would save up mow lawns and go get it uh, developed at the very prestigious Eckerd's drugstore and mm -hmm. uh, compare, you know, frame by frame, image by image, what I could have done differently. And uh, eventually from there, you know, I learned, you know, what an aperture was, what a shutter was, you know, how to deal with, you know, different film speeds. And then uh, when I turned 16, got a car and I had always had a passion for weather as well. So, combine photography with weather and then now I have a car the ability to leave oh I was gone I went and I shot as much as I could with uh severe weather and kind of tied the two together and it wasn't until like my mid-20s when I finally went to digital and then started getting uh clients and the ability to teach and uh you know one door opened another door opened and eventually uh I said hey you know I can do this you know I have a master's degree in, uh uh, undergraduate degree degree in criminal justice and all that's kind of put aside for a career now where I get to uh, share my experiences with the world and show people the beauty of this world so it's been you a never took any training. photo courses you, you're self-taught in all of this yeah I've never taken a photo co course in my life uh, so it was all literally uh, back when I first started trial and error and then going through uh, the card catalog at the library finding photography books reading up because you know we didn't have uh, YouTube wasn't a thing back then, you know, it was literally like dial up internet with AOL messenger and that's all I had as far as like access to the internet. So mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, you know, like I said, trial and error and reading in magazines and books and I have boxes and boxes of film and mm -hmm. slides that, uh, you know, were failures because I was learning, but that's, you know, how I learned and Eventually, uh, I became too poor to afford film, so I had to go digital. And, uh, you know, with the advancement of digital, that really allowed me to grow and have the, like, instant gratification of seeing what I was shooting on the camera. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, it's been a fun journey. I think I'm being fair in saying that storm chasing photography 
is pretty much on a huge rise right now. Um, it's not that it hasn't been around, and I've actually worked with and studied the work of guys like Jim Reed, um, yeah. photographers like Eric Miola, who make it an art form. Um, and I know Keith Lazinski, Chase of Storms, an icon ambassador. Uh, who do you look up to? Who, who are your inspirations? I mean, you don't just get into storm photography and chase it. Do you not research the Who inspires you to do what you do? You know, it, it was a while ago when I got into storm photography and Jim Reed was definitely uh, one of those guys that I looked up to. You know, I'd see his work in, in different books, magazines, and, um, you know, I'd always be like, man, you know, I want to be as good as him one day. And, you know, I'd strive to capture those moments that Jim would capture. And, um, you know, I even reached out to him a few times and, and just chatted with him and kind of picked his brain. And, um, and then seeing Keith, uh, his work is just phenomenal. And, you know, it's a completely different angle too, as well uh, from Jim's, you know, uh, Keith, you know, is more, he kind of has like more of the documentary style. And then Jim is going more kind of like the, for the beauty, you know, fine art style uh, shots. And, you know, seeing both of their work, um, you know, you kind of pick what you like from, you know, one person's work and another person's work. And then you say, okay, that's kind of what I want to try to achieve. But uh, those two guys have definitely been inspirational for where I've been able to take my um, severe weather imagery. Do you have a style? Do you feel like you have a style? Because honestly, I see yeah. a little bit of both in, in your work. Yeah, you know, so I did journalistic work for um, five, six years. Um, so I have a little bit of a journalistic tie into covering these scenes. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, I also like the beauty side of things. So the journalistic side tends to almost be a little bit more um, action, cause and effect, uh, you know, more so kind of effect, like, hey, here's what happened after these storms, after these tornadoes or for example, I covered the Joplin, Missouri aftermath for a while, and that was all telling a story of what these people had been through versus, you know, the past two weeks I've been out on the plains, and it's more so capturing the beauty of these storms. You know, storms are something that many people fear, um, and rightfully so, but there's also a beauty to them. So I want to kind of tie that in. So it depends on what I'm going out to shoot. If I'm going out on assignment work, it may be, a little bit of the beauty of the storms, but also more how it's affecting um, everybody afterwards. If it's just me, I personally like to capture the beauty of the storms because I used to be terrified of storms. I was from New York mm -hmm. originally. We don't have storms, you know, you know, you don't, there's no storms up there like not, that. Not so. like this. No, yeah. No. Not like what we're going to see. And I want to, at this point, just make it clear to everybody tuning in. Mike and I have spoken many times. We've talked on panel discussions together. And um, I want you to address this before we jump into the pictures. Uh, is the safety factors in what you do. Yeah, so there's definitely an inherent risk to this. Um, and it's not something I tell people, go grab your camera and go shoot a storm. You know, people are like, oh, you know, you could see a tornado. Well, it's, there, there's, no, you can't, not all the time. And there's, you know, baseball size hail, there's lightning, straight line winds, flooding. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff out there that's far more dangerous than a tornado. So. Um, you know, I don't go into this just saying, hey, I'm going to grab my camera and go shoot a storm. I also have um, an educational background in atmospheric science. So um, with that and also doing about four or five years with an experienced storm chaser before I even went out by myself, that kind of helps me get an understanding of what environment I'm going into. And, you know, most of the time you can study as much as you want about these storms and the textbook says, hey, it's going to do this. And it doesn't completely the opposite thing. And that just happened to us the other day. And um, so there's definitely um, a risk. So it's not something I recommend just going out there and doing. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's great, great advice. And I know you take precautions every time. And, and you also, I think during our panel discussions, I know you have, you always mention the element of the people in these places that you're photographing. Uh, you had mentioned it, and we'll see some of your volcano shots, but that as beautiful as these pictures are, the devastation of this affects the people around the environments you shoot in. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, that's something you gotta be ready for. Um, you know, there, there's a quote uh, from a weather meteorologist named Al Mohler who says, it's hard to enjoy the beauty of storm chasing when you know people are getting hurt. Uh, mm -hmm. So that definitely plays a role mentally while you're out there chasing. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, okay, so what I'd love to do is get a little clunky here and. All share right. the screen and let's launch the program of your image selects. And uh, man, I, 
Uh, I mean, when you mentioned the beauty of storm chasing, the beauty of, of people, um, you've done something pretty magnificent here in merging those two things and, and you know, the portrait along with this art form that you speak of. Uh, again, as, as we roll through these, I want to hear every detail about these pictures. Where are they? How did you get there? How did you know to get there? What, what was your focal length choice? You know, how did you get the model to stand there? Let's talk about it all. Yeah, for sure. So this is um, a shot from back in May of 2017, I believe it was, 17 or 16. But uh, this is south of Dodge City, Kansas. And, you know, photographing storms for years, uh, you know, the storms are beautiful themselves, but I always wanted to try and add a little bit of a human element to the shot, but it would require the perfect storm essentially. And uh, for the perfect storm, I wanted to photograph a tornado that was in good visibility, in good light, uh, didn't do any damage to anywhere that was uh, you know, personal property or caused injuries. Uh, we had a good escape route beautiful field and then obviously a model that was willing to stand in front of this tornado in a dress because let's be real i don't look good in a dress so i needed a model to do that so um yeah for this shot it took about seven years to actually get this shot um and because every time i would come close to it something else would come up like the tornado would hit a town or the light would go or i didn't have enough time or the escape route wasn't there so on this storm, um, I brought my friend Elizabeth out and uh, we saw the tornado, great visibility, hadn't caused any damage yet, had a beautiful um, escape route and just everything came together. The light was perfect. We had beautiful side lighting here going on. And so I uh, looked at her and I was like, let's do it, let's go. And so she quickly threw on a dress and ran out into uh, this field. And this tornado at this time is probably about a half mile, three quarters of a mile away uh, slightly moving towards us, but slightly moving past us. Um, mm -hmm. So we weren't really in immediate danger, but also wasn't a spot you wanted to hang around in for you know more than a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this shot here, we were close enough to use a 24 to 70. And what I wanted to do is kind of show the juxtaposition between you know the human element and the natural element. Uh, light versus dark, um, good versus evil, beauty versus darkness, all of that kind of went into it, you know, with the light and also even just the dress choice, like white rep representing good, dark clouds representing evil uh, or darkness. And, um, but yet there's an inherent beauty between the two. And uh, with the lens choice, you know, 2470, um, I also want, went with a, I believe it was a 5.6 aperture. And I didn't want anything that was too um, too deep as far as depth of field because I didn't want to draw the attention away from Elizabeth and onto the tornado. I wanted the tornado to essentially be kind of a background supporting role. And so using that shallower depth of field, I was able to get her nice and sharp, but keep that um, detail in the back, but where it wasn't almost distracting. So uh, it, it was pretty funny though, because you know, it looks like we're completely alone here. And uh, storm chasing has become a hot commodity in the past few years. So there's actually other chasers around uh, within, you know, 100 feet or so. And so it's really funny for us to run out of the car. And then all of a sudden, I'm just like, go. And I send this, you know, this girl out to a field in a white dress. And, you know, the guys are looking at me like, what is this dude doing? Um, but <laughs> it was just the perfect opportunity. And, um, you know, it, it was one of those moments, too. I having learned on film and grown up on film, I choose quality over quantity. So I try not to shoot a thousand frames while I'm out there. Um, right. But in this instance, you know, she's, if you, you look at the way the, the wheat's blowing and her dress is blowing, um, we're in what are called the inflow winds. So it's pulling that tornado and that um, mesocyclone of the storm is pulling wind inward. So all the wind is at our back. So I just rattled off and just cranked down the motor drive and went because her hair was flying everywhere and their dress was flying everywhere. So during the scene, we had about 40, 50 mile an hour winds. And by being able to just motor drive it through and shoot, you know, I think it shot like 20 frames or maybe something like that. Um, I was able to get one where her hair kind of wrapped around her neck because there's ones definitely where her hair is like over her face and her dress right. is all tangled. But 
Uh, this is the one that we, we, we chose at the end of the day and I couldn't have asked for a better condition to shoot it. And it was nice to kind of check that off the box after, you know, many years of trying to get the right scene. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this is going to apply to other images that you show, but just real quick, if you could, how do you determine an escape route? Explain escape route and how do you determine the best way to go? Yeah, so chasing is always kind of like a game of cat and mouse. You want to make sure you're ahead of the storm to get the best visibility as far as you know light and contrast goes, but that often requires you to put yourself kind of in front of the storm. So when you have a storm that's moving northeast like this, your escape route is e either east or due south, because that will get you out of the way of anything that may shift or turn or whatever. So for here, what you can see, and you get a little hint of it on the far right uh, hand of the frame is you see power lines. So maybe a half mile to our east is a road that dropped us due south. So gotcha. if we had to, for any reason, get out of here, we just bail south and you know, within a matter of minutes, we're, we're completely fine. But you always have an escape route because as I mentioned earlier, you may think you know what the storm's doing, but there's many times I've seen a storm just go, hey, here, hold my beer and watch what I can do. And yeah. uh, you have to be ready to go. Well, I, that, I think that speaks to what you had mentioned before about doing your homework, studying under somebody that knows, learning all these details, uh, and certainly uh, going out there and making dramatic pictures like these. Um, lightning shots. Well, we take the storm element. Now we add uh, a, a dynamic to it of lightning. Talk about these images and why you chose them. Yeah, so, you know, there's two different things going on here. Um, obviously, the lightning adds a whole other element to a storm. And this is a, uh, a storm in Sublake, Kansas that I shot probably about two weeks ago. Um, so this is some of my newest work. And the cool thing about this, and the reason I showed, wanted to show you guys these two images, is um, this is the same storm about 15 minutes apart. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, lightning is great to capture and I, I love it just the way you can see the electricity traveling through the air and it adds a whole another dynamic to the scene. And it's usually quite frustrating to capture. So when you actually get a photo of lightning, it's, you know, it's something to celebrate. Um, but this, the image on the left was right after kind of sunset. And then the image on the right is into blue hour, same storm. Uh, 15 minutes apart and all I did was move about five miles south from where that original image is on the left to where the second frame is on the right and you can just see how much that storm changed and the cool thing about storms is each one uh, it has its own personality and its own characteristics and this is what we call a mothership supercell and this is what we go out to shoot and these images or these, these scenes are so rare because it takes just the perfect atmosphere and the perfect dynamics within the atmosphere to create these striations and these kind of UFO looks and where you can see the whole storm twisting throughout the atmosphere. Um, and I also love uh, how you have two completely different color schemes going on. You know, the sunset, you have kind of like the, the brown and the gray going on with a little hint of the sunset off in the the distance and the ambient light from that. But then once you start getting to blue hour, you start getting those blue hues coming through the clouds and the lightning kind of has a purple look to it and uh, found this beautiful green field. So when the lightning struck, you know, it's, it's almost pitch black out during the scene. So when the lightning struck, it illuminates all the color in the field. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really cool to just be out there and see how a storm can transform within minutes, but also with you moving you know, five miles south, five miles north, uh, it creates a completely different feel. And like I said, the, these two scenes right here with the way the storm is, the shape of it, uh, the texture, the color, the striations, that's definitely a rarity in storm chasing to see a storm of um, that caliber. So pretty, pretty cool moment. I, I know for a fact that when I saw the scene on the left, man, I was, I, I was a bit, uh, bit giddy to say the least you know just you know oh my gosh we've driven hundreds of miles and hours and hours and hours and now we're finally getting something that is the perfect storm for photography and you know it's I think it's something that separates uh myself from other storm photographers is a lot of photographers go out there with the mindset of I need to see a tornado and if I don't see a tornado it's a 
waste of a day or it's a bust. And for me, like I just love storms, period. And there's so much beauty to them. If you get a tornado, it's the icing on the cake. But seeing something like this, um, I'll take this over a tornado any day. It's just so much more beautiful and the power behind it too. And the image on the right too, one of the reasons that I chose to shoot at that spot there is the scale. Uh, you have the houses and the farms off in the distance there. And yeah, the storm's beautiful, but that little bit of scale, when you see that massive supercell over, you know, a tiny little house that really gives you uh, an idea of just how big these storms are. Yet, if it's over an open field, you don't really have that, that scale to say, you know, this is massive. So there is a little bit of thought process in that, in that shot. They're not just, hey, I'm going to pull over and, and shoot here. And how, how far away are these storms, each of these? Uh, both of these were shot with the uh, 14 to 24 at 14 millimeters. So uh, they're maybe, gosh, a mile and a half, two miles away at this okay. point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's also something else, you know, out there chasing is you have to, I love shooting wide. So I love pushing the limits just a little bit to get that 14 millimeter shot, but, and have the storm right there. But you also have to understand how quick the storm's moving, what your escape route is, the direction, all that stuff. So this was just essentially, like I said, the perfect storm for this kind of photography. It was moving slow. I had a great road south, so I could just get out of its way as it came towards me and, uh, and that 14 millimeter just worked out beautifully. Tripod, um, long exposure. Um, yeah, so yeah, tri uh, the, the, the image on the left, both of these are tripoded shots, uh, long-ish long exposures. So daylight lightning or uh, sunset lightning is a little bit more uh, challenging because you, you really lower your ISO down as far as possible, bring your aperture up and try to get, you know, maybe a one second or half a second long exposure and then you just continuously shoot and, and hope. Uh, twilight into nighttime, uh, uh, nighttime lightning shots is a little bit easier, uh, but you can do longer exposures, but you also have to kind of figure out the lightning because if you're looking for you know, a lightning shot that's off in the distance, you know, your exposure may be like say 200 ISO, F8, uh, 15 seconds. But then if you get a close bolt, uh, that may blow out your frame. So then if you're looking for the close bolts, you maybe go down to like 100 ISO, F11, and then a short exposure. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, lightning is a little frustrating to shoot because usually you have one setting and then you get a distant little bird fart lightning bolt, and then you get another close one and it blows right. out your frame. So it, it's, it's very rewarding when you get a photo of a lightning bolt in focus, tack sharp, perfectly right. exposed, and in your frame. I, I have so many shots where, you know, I have half a bolt coming through the top right of the frame, and then it's out of the frame, and, and uh, you know, it's it's not it's not an image you'll ever see. Yeah, that's that reminds me of the bird photos I take. We have nothing but the claws of the bird and a half a wing. Yeah, um, beautiful, so beautiful images. Uh, this is awesome too. Again, this 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 can't happen every time you go out. Rainbows uh, through the storm. But I got to say, either using a long telephoto or this looks like it's really close to you. Yeah, so this is uh, April 22nd of this year, Medilla, Oklahoma. Uh, yeah, no, you don't, you don't get rainbows through tornadoes that are, you know, side lit and, high, you know, beautiful contrast and beautiful light. Uh, this is in, you know, almost 20 years of chasing now, this has never happened to me. So, um, but, but the reason I chose this image to share with you guys is, also, you know, everybody sees these photos um, and they're like, oh, they're so beautiful, which they are, but there is a, another side of chasing. Uh, this was a scene that I, I hesitated on for a bit to actually share because what's next to me by 100 feet is a body. Um, so we stopped, the first priority of chasing, if a town gets hit, is we stopped to render aid and came across somebody that was injured severely, went to uh, do first aid CPR and all that stuff, and then the medics showed up, and then I started shooting these shots. Uh, so seeing this shot here now, and knowing that that person survived, um, 
you know, I'm happy to talk about it because it, it shows you that you're looking at something where people are like, it's so beautiful. It's a tornado with a rainbow, but yet there is a devastating side of this. And that's the part that you have to respect. Um, mm. So, but I, I do love this shot and this is going to be up on the wall. Um, you know, it, it's one of those images that you don't get. Like tornadoes are mostly hidden in the rain or grungy, low contrast. Here you have a rainbow going through with high contrast, beautiful visibility. And this was shot, I believe this was shot on my 24 to 70 or maybe may have been 70 to 200. I think it's 70 millimeters either way. Right. Um, and personally, I would have liked to get a little bit closer to it, but we had uh, big power lines across the road, so we couldn't go anywhere. So we had to kind of pull over here and take advantage of the scene right there and you can actually see if you look closely to the trees uh, a lot of them are broken and that's where uh, kind of the outer edges the outer circulation of the tornado had passed and snapped some trees and all that stuff but uh, there's a lot that happened in this scene here that had a whole bag of emotion to it but mm -hmm. knowing like I said that guy survived and this is one of the most beautiful tornado shots I've ever had it will definitely be on the wall I could totally be misreading Are those birds in the trees or are those broken parts of the trees? Those are broken parts of the trees. And then if you, if you were to ever zoom in to where the rainbow is in the tornado, you'll see debris lofted in the air, like parts of homes, wow. parts of buildings, stuff like that. Um, but now the, I think those, uh, yeah, those are all definitely broken pieces of the trees. Uh, I, I assume you're shooting in the raw file format. What color modes are you setting? Yeah. White so balance. I, Usually, uh, I'll shoot everything in Kelvin for white balance, like 5,600. Um, I'll change that or tweak that a little bit as the day progresses, uh, maybe cool it down a little bit later in the afternoon, but usually shooting in kind of like a neutral or, or flat color profile, um, definitely shooting in raw. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I aim to get as much right in the camera as possible. I think that comes from the film days but having that raw capability definitely helps in, in situations where you definitely, you know, have a, a good dynamic range to work with right. in the frame. So uh, here, the only thing I would ever have done differently is, uh, and this, you know, the chaos of storm chasing, you know, you look back you're like, oh, I wish I did that. And then you realize I only had seconds to get this image. Polarizer. If I had thrown the polarizer on, could have helped pop that rainbow a little bit more. Uh, mm -hmm. But once again, uh, I'm completely happy with how this frame turned out. Beautiful. Uh, did I hear you say before it's going to be hanging on my wall shortly? Is that what yeah. you said? <laughs> maybe, maybe I misunderstood. Maybe it was your wall. You'll get a pattern. Right. I okay. know what it is. Uh, speaking of hanging on the wall, I'm very proud to be an owner of this picture. Um, we're shifting gears from weather to something even more challenging in my book. I think they're both ridiculously challenging, but... Um, Volcanoes. What made you turn to volcanoes from the storm chasing and uh, and put yourself in another, I guess, position that's very critical and, and could be very dangerous? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've always had a fascination with um, natural elements and tornadoes being my first fascination, volcanoes being the second. Um, so and I also I also like going to capture images that most people would be like, you're out of your mind or I would never do that. Um, so when Kilauea erupted back in 2017, uh, it had a lava flow that was going down towards the ocean. And at that time, I was just like, I'm going. Like, there's no, no doubt I'm going. I'm going to go out there. I want to see the volcano. I want to feel the volcano. I want to experience it. And, uh, you know, you think it's easy. You know, you, you, go, you go out to a volcano. You walk out. You see lava. Done. Um, that was me being naive. And not knowing anything about this. You know, I know storms, I know nothing about volcanoes. Uh, mm -hmm. This ended up being, long story short, a 13 mile round trip hike to go find lava. And it took four or five days to scout the location and find where the lava actually was flowing. And I didn't just go out there blind. I had spoken with a lot of the park rangers in uh, Hawaii's Volcanoes National Park. I had spoken to the guides. I had spoken to other photographer friends who have been out on the uh, lava fields before and kind of got mm -hmm. a ton of advice from them. And, uh, you know, it turned out to be a 13 mile hike out. And my goal, it's funny because this image was never one I intended to capture. 
Uh, I never went out there saying, I'm going to capture the Milky Way, an Iridium flare, Mars, Venus, the moon, all over the lava. I went out there with the intention of getting a beautiful sunset over the lava and hiked out there 13 miles. And I remember when I was hiking out there, probably a few miles in, kind of had that, uh, what in the heck am I doing moment? Uh, you know, this is not, this is totally out of my comfort zone. You know, there's sulfuric, uh, or sulfur dioxide gases. There's lava tubes that are collapsed. There's, you know, the lava that you're walking on is, is cool lava, but it's, uh, sharp as glass. And I kind of almost pulled the trigger on going back and I was like, no, I gotta, I gotta get something. So I remember walking out and, uh, one of the advices that I got from a friend, because I asked them, I was like, how do you know when you're near the lava? And they literally said, you'll know. And uh, I remember turning the corner and all of a sudden just the extreme heat would hit me. And uh, during the daylight hours, it's actually kind of hard to see the lava because it it's, doesn't have the glow. Uh, but I felt it for sure. And it sounded like Rice Krispies popping. I'll never forget that sound. And I remember just kind of standing there and just like screaming like, yes, you know, I finally got to it. And then I reassessed the situation and realized that there was not a single cloud in the sky. And I was like, cool. I just hiked all the way out here to shoot sunset over this lava and there's no clouds. And as a landscape photographer, you know, you clouds make or break a scene. Uh, so I shot some images and then I was going to hightail it back and I was like, wait a second, hold on, take a moment, breathe. You have no clouds but you have a quarter moon in the sky. So maybe, maybe you can get some moonlit shots. And then I realized the quarter moon in the sky was actually far enough away from the core of the Milky Way that I might be able to, to get both. So I waited for uh, twilight to fade and found a good area where the lava was moving, but not moving too quickly to where I would have to, to rush. And shooting lava, you have to, you have to be on your toes at all times because it's always moving. But also, you know, at times, depending on how close you are, you only have a few seconds to set up your tripod, take the shot, um, and then move before it gets just too hot for you to stand there. And for this shot here, the lava was actually cooling. It was moving slightly, but cooling. Mm -hmm. So I had enough time to set the tripod up, uh, frame the shot, and start shooting some images. But the issue was just to the left of the frame is a bigger pile of lava that had erupted and it's creating a huge lens flare across the, uh, the 14 to 24. And so, you know, I, I tried a couple things. I tried holding my hand out to try and, uh, you know, flag that light. And my hand was just definitely not enough to, to, to cut it out. And so I was like, all right, if I stand over to the left, use a cable to release, trigger the shot, I might be able to use my body essentially as a huge right. lens hood. Mm -hmm. Well, took one shot, was able to see, hey, okay, here's the Milky Way, here's the moon, cool. Um, but huge lens flare. So I took the cable to release, stood about two feet over to the left, and I was like, okay, this is really hot. Took a shot, went back over, looked. I hadn't flagged enough light off, so I had to move even closer to the lava. And... I ended up singeing off my leg hairs as I took the shot because I was right. that close to the lava. And I, I took, the, took the shot, went back, realized I had flagged off all the light and actually gotten a, an iridium flare. I thought it was a meteor at a time, but it's actually an iridium flare, which is in the top left corner. And that's a satellite that's moving through the sky and the panels off the satellite actually reflect the sunlight back to earth. Uh, so it's a pretty cool uh, event in the night sky. And then some uh, astronomy guys afterwards also pointed out that I had Venus and Mars in the frame as well, just to the right of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. um, so when I saw that happen, I was like, there's, I can't top this. Uh, I'm heading back. And um, when I put this online, a lot of people said, hey, you know, that's fake. That's photoshopped. There's no way you can get that in one frame. And this is indeed all one exposure, one frame, uh, very little em uh, editing to it. So the details behind it was it shot at f2.8, 2, or 2500 ISO, uh, and I think it was 20 seconds or so. And what the original out-of-frame camera uh, shot looks like, 
or out of, out of camera shot looks like is uh, the Milky Way, the sky is a little bit dark and the lava is also a little bit dark. But knowing the dynamic range of the camera, I knew that I can pull up the sky and the details and the shadows and the blacks to reveal this entire scene and not blow out the moon or the lava. So um, it is indeed all one shot. And, you know, the little icing on the cake was that iridium flare coming through. But I, I went back and I was really happy about this shot, put it up. It uh, went pretty viral and got licensed by a few, few different publications. And uh, it's definitely one of those shots that um, when people find out I shot that, they're like, oh, you're the, you're the crazy guy who did that shot. So I want to ask you, you mentioned this, but you never really said the actual distance. You put your hand up and you're feeling that heat. Yeah. How far are you officially away from the closest spot of danger? Uh, so at, when I stood there to flag off the light, I was about eight inches from the lava. And Ooh. that's where it literally singed off my leg hair and melted off the bottom part of my hiking boots. So I literally walked back at the bottom of my hiking boots just flapping open like that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's pretty hot. It's, uh, I think it's 2100 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. Mm -hmm. So uh, you feel it and uh, it's, uh, it's nothing you wanna, you wanna mess with. Beautiful, beautiful image. Different kind of image. You said you like to put people in your frame. Um, a little bit of explosive action here. What's going on? Yeah, so completely different feel. Um, the previous image was shot in Hawaii's uh, Volcanoes National Park. A pretty, pretty well controlled environment. The lava wasn't moving too quickly or um, the threat, I mean, there was a threat there, but it wasn't like a, a huge threat. This is when I went out in 2018 to document the uh, Kilauea eruption in Leilani Estates, which is the uh, lower east rift zone of Kilauea in Hawaii. And I went out there to document the eruption um, and completely different feel, like lots of immediate danger, fissures erupting everywhere. I think there were 24 fissures in total, uh, methane explosions. Uh, literally, you could witness the ground cracking and the streets opening up in front of you as you're moving around because of the uh, magma going underneath the surface. Um, so this is a, an, an image where it's my last day out there and it happened to just work out perfectly that fissure number eight um, began to violently erupt. Now, most of the fissures were erupting maybe 60, 50 feet up into the air. Fissure mm -hmm. eight on this day erupted to 300 feet into the air. And uh, we were out there being escorted. Uh, the media was being escorted with um, the, the National Guard. And unfortunately, they were not taking us where the images were. And, you know, the saying is you got to go where the images are. So um, I may or may not have caught a ride with a local in their pickup truck to get into this area here. And it was one of the most incredible scenes I've ever seen. The, the fisher was only maybe three, 400 feet away at this time. And it sounded like a jet engine going off and just see huge things of, of molten lava flying up into the air. And once again, it was a beautiful scene and I have so many images of this scene without that person. And you have no idea how big that fissure right. is. And when I saw this guy walking around with a gas mask out there, my, my first thought was you're crazy. Um, Cause I know you're way, way too close out there. But then, you know, the photographer part of me was like, Oh, Mike, grab, grab your lens real quick and, and hop back and get a scale shot. So he was walking around there and I was photographing him. And I just love this, this scene in particular right here because he's, he's looking up and um, when you're photographing volcanoes and you're downwind, you always want to have a gas mask on because of the sulfur dioxide. Well, the winds had shifted, so we were now upwind. So it was safe to have your mask off. So he lifted his mask up and I love the, the outline of his, you know, you see the canister up there and you can actually identify that that's a gas mask that he's got on there. And right. uh, the contrast between the two, the scale, everything has worked out really nicely. And it was a, uh, a great way to just show once again, that same thing with the beauty and the beast shot, but the juxtaposition between the human and the natural element and just showing how, you know, we think, we think we're almighty. We're not, you know, like nature rules everything. And 
uh, here, that just shows the power that we don't have and the power nature has. And once again, shows the scale there. So uh, yeah, I just love everything about this frame here. And it was shot with the 70 to 200 millimeter. Uh, the only thing I wish I could have done a little bit differently is wait a little bit later on for uh, some better light because you know, lava, obviously super bright. Uh, right. So you have to expose uh, for that. And uh, you know, when I shot this shot originally straight out of the camera, once again, this is where the raw files um, are really beneficial. I was exposing for the lava, so all that black hardened lava was really dark, so I had to pull that up um, using uh, the dynamic range of the camera. And this is all shot on the 850, um, so a lot of dynamic range there. But just love this scene here, and, and it was one of those scenes too, like, you know, you, you're there and every part of you is telling you, you shouldn't be there. And, you know, you get the heck out of here, and especially for me not having much experience, with um, with uh, volcanoes, I I was like, okay, you know, let me get some shots, get out of here, but I also want to stay. Um, sure. So it's just one of those scenes, and it's actually tattooed on my arm now, the latitude and longitude from where I took that frame, because uh, I've got a tattoo over here where I, I photographed the northern lights for the first time, so the coolest thing you can see above your head, and this right. is this this spot right here, so the coolest thing you can naturally see um, at your feet. So really cool moment. And, uh, I definitely wanted a shot like this for the story of, um, of this eruption that shows just the power of it. Beautifully, beautifully done. Now I know what this is, but you tell us what it is. <laughs> so yeah, this is, um, from the same eruption, but, uh, eventually the problem that we ran into photographing the, uh, Leilani Estates area is the lava just became too much and you started to have uh, a, a wall of cool lava get higher and higher and higher. You know, we're talking almost 50, 60 feet in places and you can no longer see the, lo the molten lava. So I uh, took to the air to find different perspectives of this event mm -hmm. and chartered a helicopter. And once again, you know, I wanted to show the journalism side of it, show the destruction, show what was going on to the people of Leilani the States, but the beauty. And I remember flying over this area of what was essentially a nine mile long river of lava that was a quarter to half mile wide in places. And looking down and where the lava slowed, where you got more into like a flat terrain, uh, it started to, to cool and, and, and harden on the top. And that would give you these really cool, intricate details and zigzags of lava as it all started to kind of um, come together and slow down. And I thought that was really cool. So I shot a bunch of texture shots from the helicopter. And we're, we're at 3,000 feet up here. So this is looking down, shooting with the 850. This is uncropped, but shooting with the 850 and the 200 to 400 out of a helicopter. And... Mm -hmm what we'd have to do to get the shot is we'd have to bank the helicopter really hard to the right so I can get the skids out of the frame. Cause if you're just looking down out of a helicopter, you have the skid in your way. So we would bank really hard to get the shot and get the skids out of the way. But you know, I shot a bunch of texture shots and then this is the coolest thing ever is I coming down this river of lava was this, it almost looked like an Island of, cooled lava like a chunk of and, and this is about a school bus in length it's it's huge um and we kind of termed them uh uh lava bergs like icebergs just floating down and it would be moving through and, and i thought that was such a cool uh thing to see that we kind of followed it in the helicopter down the river and right. uh we'd shoot it straight down and i just love the the difference in texture you have the hot molten lava where you can see all the reds and oranges and all that color coming through. And then you have this cool island of what's called a uh, lava and you get the braids and you can see how the lava has cooled uh, through the events and it's just floating through. And um, one thing I did while I was out there is I, I shared a lot of my images with the locals because they wanted, they all had to evacuate and they wanted to see, you know, what we were seeing in there because they couldn't go in. And so I showed this to some of the locals and it was kind of, Term or uh, named Pele's eye, and Pele is the 
uh, goddess of lava or the volcano god in Hawaiian culture. And so when people saw this immediately, and it, it was so many different people that saw it and said, oh, that's Pele's eye. And so that's kind of the name of this image is Pele's eye. And uh, just one of my favorite shots and such a unique angle on, uh, on the event. And, you know, I love, you know, this from past chats. I love shooting from helicopters and just opening people's eyes to what you can't see from ground level. And this is probably one of my favorite images ever from the air. Beautiful, beautifully done. This, uh, again, from the air, I would assume, uh, yep. pretty, pretty high up. I love uh, both of these images, the image prior to this one and, and this image here, the, 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 the detail, the, the design, the pattern, everything. Um, what's going on here? Because this is wild. So, uh, yeah, no. So besides from some air sickness, because you'll see why after this image here, it took a lot of work to get this frame. Uh, this is over the glacial rivers of Iceland, over the highlands of Iceland. And I've shot there many times before, and the, these rivers are just beautiful and they're stunning. The way that the, the water has different looks because of the silt, you know, you get turquoise, you get aqua, you get green, uh, some areas you get gold. And this area here, I had flown in the week prior and it just blew my mind. Just the colors, the, the contrast, the blues, the, like I said, the, the turquoise, all that against the darker browns and all that. And, you know, I photographed the heck out of it. But then afterwards, I was like, you know, it's really hard to, to comprehend scale. And that's something that I like to convey in my imagery is scale. And, um, you know, we're, we're flying maybe probably, I'd say, 4,000, 3,000 feet above these glacial rivers. And you have no idea what you're looking at or how big or, or small they are from that. So mm -hmm. um, the pilot I was working with, I, I was talking with him, I was like, hey, do you have another pilot friend who has, you know, a good looking plane that we can fly and photograph over the highlands and add some sense of scale to? And uh, so, yeah, we teamed up for it and we flew out there and it's about an hour flight from taking off from uh, the wreck of big air airport. And uh, I realized this was a lot, a lot harder idea than I had initially um, interpreted and mm -hmm. flying the, the problem was right off the bat like I was like okay I can just shoot down and photograph this plane over the rivers well flying side by side you don't really have that shape to the image that you want or the feel to the image you want um, I just felt like the plane was leading you out of the frame the entire time so what we ended up having to do is we would do uh, these loops or orbits around this area and the other pilot would go out and do some bigger orbits. And what we tried to do is get, as we're going one way, he's coming in the other way and crossing below us. Right. And you have a matter of like three, four seconds tops to get him in and out of the frame or in the frame before he's out of the frame. And it took a long time and a lot of, uh, a lot of just staying focused because, you know, you're sitting up there in the airplane doing donuts for, you know, 30 minutes. It, it wears on you looking, especially looking through a tighter, tighter lens. Let, um, me, let me, Mike, let me jump to yeah. that next picture then to show people what you're talking about. And then we'll come back to this so they can see it again. But this is the pattern of flying you're talking about, right? Yeah, this is just our flight path. So you can see all the different donuts we did in loops and some of them are wider, some of them are tighter. You can see some areas where we may have uh, had to take a moment to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, all of that is right over that glacial river area, which is the blue area there. And it took a long time for us to line both planes up altitude wise, speed wise, and also um, location wise, because there had been a bit of snow that had fallen on the rivers. So with the wings of the plane being white, I didn't want them to be over any of the snow because you, you wouldn't have that isolation, that separation. Right. So the first time I got the shot, I actually got it really nicely, but the right wing tip is in the snow and you lose the plane. So, you know, I was like, oh man, all right, we got to do this again. And this is all shot 24 to 70, I believe around like 50 millimeters, 60 mm -hmm. millimeters. So yeah, the, the first time I got it, it was a, that plane was a little bit over to the left, right in that snow. And so we had to reposition and, when he came by here, once again, it was a matter of three, four seconds before he's in and out of the frame. And I just rattled off and, uh, and finally saw this one where, you know, the wing tips were in, a, in an area of uh, a clean background and high contrast. And you could see that red popping 
And right. uh, I just love this shot because of every, all the hard work that went into it, but also the sense of scale and the color contrast. And once again, kind of that human element tied into the beauty of, of the landscape. Yep, that totally pulled it off. Amazing flight plan. And we've got this last image that you've selected for us that again, I just, it's stunning. I mean, the work you do is just stunning. Um, where are you? How do you do this? If people want to go do this, tell us all the little tricks and secrets uh, behind this one. Yeah, so this is up in Banff National Park in Canada. And uh, I've photographed the Northern Lights all over the world. And, you know, people say, oh, you got to go to Iceland, you got to go to Norway for the lights. This is the best Northern Lights I've ever seen and it was in Canada. Um, and I almost walked away from it. So one thing I encourage people to do is, you know, when I, when I teach my, my photography classes, I'd say, Hey, you're here to learn the P word. And everybody's like, Oh, photography. I'm like, no patience. You're here to learn patience mm -hmm. because these shots don't just present themselves. And this was a night where the Northern lights were supposed to come out and they came out a little bit. Um, and typically 11 to 1 AM is the best time to see them, uh, in this area. And so went out to the lake, saw a little bit of them, but for what was forecast, I was kind of let down. I was like, oh man, you know, this is supposed to be a big show and we're seeing some green, but nothing great. And I had packed up the camera, walked back about halfway to the car. And then you just have, sometimes you have that gut feeling like, okay, you're messing up, you know, stop. And I had that. And so I went back and I was like, okay, I'll give it another hour. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And the following day, I was actually driving back from Canada to Texas. So I was trying to think, all right, I don't want to be too tired to drive, but I don't want to miss this. So I went back, set up the camera. And the cool thing about the Northern Lights is they're so unpredictable. They can literally turn on and off like the flip of a switch. Right. And Right before this, there was just like, you could see that triangular peak in the center of the bottom center of the frame. There was just a little bit of green. That's it. And then within seconds, the sky erupted to this with purples and pinks and rapidly moving curtains. And the whole sky was just essentially shaking. And I started shooting some frames and they're all 14 millimeters. And I looked up and I noticed that the whole Aurora was arcing over us. And I was like, all right, I, this is going to, I got to try it. So I did a panorama. So this is actually a nine image panorama of the Northern Lights stitched together all at 14 millimeter shot vertically. And I'm going to say, did you? Yeah. Yeah. All vertically uh, oriented. And the key to this shot was I had to move fast. So with the Northern Lights, you're typically shooting at a higher ISO, say 3,200, 2.8 aperture, maybe 10 seconds. This show was so incredible that I was able to shoot at 800 ISO F 2.8 in like one or two seconds. And it literally lit up the entire landscape green. So what I did is one, two second uh, exposure here, quickly moved all the way across and uh, kept the frame as level as possible to give myself the ability to stitch it as cleanly as possible. And just by moving very quickly and essentially taking 10, 20 seconds, whatever, to get across the entire um, field of view, uh, it was able to stitch together really nicely. So this is, once again, a huge panorama, multiple images stitched together, and it gives you almost a 180 degree view right. of the scene. So just to the left of that mountain in the center of the frame is due north. And then on the right side of the frame, you're almost looking southeast, almost due south. Uh, so one of the wilder moments, and you know, I, I was laughing after I shot this, that how frustrating it would have been, and I think I would have been in tears to be driving back to the hotel and then see this erupt behind me. So yeah, uh, you know, you, you, you got to work for the images, and yeah. you know, a lot of people don't understand the work that goes into it um, and the patience. And you know, with the Northern Lights, honestly, nine out of time, time, ten times, you're not going to see much. Right. But that one time, it makes all the effort, all the sleepless nights so worth it. And uh, this one's hanging on my wall right behind the computer here. One of my favorite shots I've ever taken. That's beautiful. It's so beautifully done. Let me, uh, let me get out of the program. Let me bring you back up to full screen. There you are. Uh, stunning. I don't know what else to say. You're kind of speechless in a way, but you filled in all the blanks with all the details. So uh, it's pretty remarkable um, what's going on now. 
you said you just came back from a big trip. Where do you go next? Yeah, so it's a, it's a lovely week home, and then I'm back out to Tornado Alley. So uh, it's been eight, I've, I've been working on some new projects this year. That uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But mm -hmm. uh, it's been 8,000 miles so far on the road this season. Uh, the weather seems to have calmed down a little bit right now because of uh, the tropical storm that went through the Gulf. So we've got to get our moisture back. And then next weekend, I'll be heading back out for another week on the plains to see what we can get. So excited for that. We're excited for you too. Keep sharing these images. They're beautiful. Thank you for all the tips. Um, you are at, uh, at Mike Mez Photo, right? That's your handle yep. yes, for sir. Instagram. And Mike Mez Photo is your website? Yeah, MikeMezPhotography.com is my website. MikeMezPhotography.com. Yep. Got it. People, check out this man's work. Um, uh, these were great backstories. Uh, I learned a ton and, um, uh, yeah, just, I would always say be safe. Uh, those of you tuning in, I know Mike uh, feels the same way. Learn about this, go out with educated people. If you're going to storm chase, make sure you, uh, use every precaution you possibly can when you're doing this kind of photography, but beautiful, beautiful work, Mike. Thank you for giving us your time today. I appreciate it. You guys. Yeah, thank you. Those of you tuning in to the Creators Hour with Mike Mezuel, thank you guys so much. Uh, go to NikonUSA.com backslash uh, Creators Hour and see more of the content we've created over the last several months and the content uh, that is to come. Check out the calendar. Uh, check out what we're doing online. And by all means, everybody out there, um, just go out and create. That's what we're doing these sessions for. We want you to be inspired. We want you to to follow your passions in photography. So go out there, create, and share those images with us. So for Nikon, I am Mike Corrado. Everybody out there, be safe, and we will see you soon.